Agra, Dr. Uh, Amod Shankar Vashne. Dr. Krishnan, you should raise your hand. <laughs> Give him a hand. Yes. And Amod Shankar Vashne, Honorary Secretary of IMA, Agra. Ah, there he is, my good friend. Dr. Akesh Mathur, my dear friend from uh, uh, Delhi in the Saket City Hospital and uh, chairman of radiology and imaging and a pioneer in his field. Dr. Mohammed Khalid from Agra, from uh, Aligarh, uh, from radiology and imaging, a distinguished figure. Dr. M. M. Singh, a very important personage, being the foremost physician from Agra. Uh, the nation is proud of him. Uh, I'm eagerly waiting for his presence. Deepak Rotre, my colleague and friend, Onco-surgeon, Deepak Rotre, <laughs> yes, I recognize him, and he is uh, from uh, Noida. Professor Gennady Vlasov, have great honor, sir, in acknowledging your gracious presence. <laughs> Dr. U.K. Singh from Agra, I'm grateful for your presence. He is principal of FH Medical College here. Dr. Sandeep Pagarwal, the oncologist from Agra. We are waiting for his presence. <coughs> there he is. Such a great pleasure having you all here. We have a strong faculty today, and I'm very proud to introduce them to you. the star, the chief guest of uh, this academic uh, uh, symposium is Professor Carol Sikora from London, United Kingdom. He is truly a trailblazing oncologist. Um, I think he's a big presence in the oncology space, trained in Cambridge and later he led, he directed Hammersmith Hospital program and also its research. Then he has gone on to occupy very important positions in the WHO and also in a, uh, UK um, uh, health department in advisory capacity. He has also launched the Cancer Partners UK, a network uh, which um, <coughs> initiates research and also delivery uh, of cancer care uh, to the largest possible population. This is extended to an international partnership as well, cancer partners. And um, his present preoccupations are with affordable care uh, reaching to the developing countries. He has traveled very widely and I don't think there's any corner of the world he has not approached for spreading the delivery of cancer care. He's also interested in alternative methods of medicine so that he's a man of many parts. He wants to integrate the best in non-allopathic medicine as well to bring to the patients betterment because he believes in wellness. It's not just about being free from disease but also having the positive experience of wellness. His books are widely read. You know, the, the postgraduates, I think it's become a Bible in his hand. Uh, the textbook of, I think, the treatment of cancer, the standard British postgraduate book. He showed me his latest uh, edition a short while ago, just hot from the oven, warm as it were, to 2015 edition. This is the sixth edition. I think the first edition was sometime maybe uh, in the latter part of last century. So, uh, so this has been doing the rounds. There's a handbook of oncology as well. There are innumerable papers. They are very hard to, uh, to summarize, in fact. I have the honor to introduce Professor G.K. Rath. Professor Rath, sir? Yeah. Professor G.K. Rath is presently head 
National Cancer Institute, Chief of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Institute of Research in Cancer, Professor, Department of Radiation Oncology in All India Medical Institute, the premier institution of the country. With a career spanning nearly four decades, he is widely regarded as a doyen in the field of radiation oncology in India. He's a recipient of innumerable prestigious awards and, <coughs> and uh, in recognition of his vast experience as a clinician, teacher, and researcher, they run into uh, scores of awards. His special areas of research include gynecological cancer, breast cancer, head and neck cancer, and brachytherapy. He's presently engaged in the creation of cancer treatment infrastructure in the country through chairmanship or membership of a number of governmental initiatives such as the Expert Committee for Establishment of a National Cancer Institute at the Ames II campus in Charger, Haryana, an Expert Committee of the University Grants Commission, UGC, to prepare guidelines, guidelines for the procurement, of, procurement, storage, utilization, and disposal of radioactive and other hazardous material and chemicals. So very important positions he has held with great distinction. Among his numerous publications, of which again run into 250, he has edited the textbook of radiation oncology, principles and practice. Uh, I think the first edition came out in 2003. And presently he is engaged uh, in uh, uh, research relating to extracorporeal irradi irradiation of malignant bone tumors and in the value of retrospective patient data analysis in oncology, which is so important, we are not aware of the degree of the problem. And unless we have these inputs, how can we plan ahead? I have great pleasure in introducing my friend, Dr. Heman Singhal, uh, who is the other distinguished member of the faculty. He was clinical lead for Northwest London Hospitals. <laughs> Heman Singhal. He is firstly, I must say, he's a graduate and postgraduate of the premier institution of the country, All India Medical Institute. He has been the lead for Northwest London Hospital Breast Service and senior lecturer at Imperial College. He has also been trained uh, at the Royal Marsden uh, Institute, which is a very widely known, internationally known uh, center in uh, London. He is also trained in, on, uh, in the, in the um, St. George's Institute uh, Hospital in London, and also in Ontario. He has rounded off his training in Cardiff uh, for breast reconstruction. And so he is uh, one who is very passionate about integrating uh, plastic surgery in oncology, oncoplasty, and breast conservation surgery. And then he was also instrumental in setting up the Sentinel Node program in Northwest London. I now want to introduce my good friend, Dr. Aditya Gupta. Aditya? So young though he may be, he's a very distinguished and leading neurosurgeon, again an alumnus of All India Institute, both at graduation and post-graduation. He's additional director of neurosurgery at the Medanta Medicity in Gurgaon. He's a well-known neurosurgeon with over 15 years of experience, and he's known for innovative surgical procedures for a wide range of conditions not just brain tumors and spinal diseases, but also in several advanced surgical procedures, such as deep brain stimulation, epilepsy surgery, stereotactic radio surgery, nerve and brachial plexus surgery, and cerebrovascular surgery. He has been granted several uh, research uh, grants and awards uh, that include uh, the Chief of Army Staff Award, Voice Cast Fellowship Award, as well as the Sir Durabji Tata that I think it's time for uh, the uh, start of the academic session. Um, can we get this started? So I am the opening batsman. Usually the stars follow the opening one. So uh, I let's go right at the top. You know, there have been today, after my talk, there's going to be um, 
plenty to talk about in innovations and what, how the cancer uh, detection and treatment has been, has become so sophisticated, so, uh, so continually evolving that we have been able to reduce mortality, uh, perhaps morbidity, and Carol will tell you how by 2030 things are going to be very much better than what it is today. But still, it's an extremely dreaded disease. And we often think that a cancer patient, when he becomes seriously ill, critically ill, before I start, I must invite the chairpersons. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Mathur, please, it's my privilege to invite you as chairperson. Dr. Rakesh Mathur is a chairman of radiology and imaging at the Saket City Hospital. He started his career in the early 1980s uh, when uh, CT scan uh, was, was, was not there and then he's the one who started the first CT scanner in Sir Gangaram Hospital and later on went on to develop uh, a pioneering role in the space, particularly in CT imaging of the chest. Uh, can I call Deepak Rothre on the stage please as the next uh, chairperson? Deepak Rothre spent a distinguished career in the Army uh, as an oncosurgeon and presently he is uh, head of oncosurgery at the uh, you know, uh, Noida Cancer uh, 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 Fortis Cancer Center, and he will soon be with us at the Nayati Healthcare in this uh, in this role. So coming back to the the uh, treatment of cancer, how it has evolved in management of cancer in you know, three arms of cancer treatment have evolved. However, when a patient becomes critically ill and is there with on organ support in the ICU, many times we have a very nihilistic attitude spelling out a grim prognosis. We think already the basic disease is so, so serious and on top of that you have an extremely ill-looking patient on life support, then perhaps we should talk about futile care, we should talk about comfort care and move the paradigm and the goals of care. However, things are not so grim or gloomy. We need to revisit this preconceived notion because there's been improved understanding of the pathophysiology and recognition of complications. There have been improved diagnostic strategies and tools in, the, in critical care and the holistic concepts of palliative care and advances have made a difference. And we have a more nuanced understanding, perhaps which is evolving, to how to move uh, the switch goals. So who are the patients who, who enter critical, who are admitted to critical care? Many times you find the first diagnosis of malignancy is made as a surprise in the critical care setting. Case in point is this, a 63 year old who was supposedly well until three months back, a tobacco chewer, not a, not a smoker though, who presented with fever, cough and breathlessness. He was treated with antibiotics, antibiotics and then later on as it usually happens, treated for TB. And you see an X-ray riddled with these infiltrates. And diagnostic approach is contextual, and you wondered what his disease was. And therefore, a biopsy was done, which revealed bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So there are several reasons why patients get admitted. It could be a post-operative care, which is simple enough, for intensive monitoring, nursing, and in the presence of comorbid conditions, or it may be complications due to the disease, or complications due to attributable treatment, or acute illness. 
which may occur as a part of the uh, comorbid states. Okay, example of acute illness related to the underlying disease I want to present to you is a young woman with unexplained fever and severe anemia. And as we were investigating her, we found that she had evidence of multiple myeloma with a serum total protein level of 14 gram. And as we were planning her further treatment and management, she suddenly became very hypoxic, became too ill, and we found her on a ventilator with an endotracheal tube in place. Fundoscopy <coughs> revealed evidence of venous stasis retinopathy. So we suspected the hyperviscosity state. You can see there's nothing very remarkable right. about the chest X-ray or CT scan. It could easily be interpreted as an acute pneumonia or some type of ARDS, mm -hmm. acute respiratory distress syndrome. However, it's always contextual. Diagnosis and treatment approach. And we treated her with, after taking a bronchoalveolar lavage, which revealed no uh, suspicious infection, three cycles of plasma phoresis, hydration, control of hypercalcemia, and thalidomide. So in six days, she was off the ventilator. So you can see the list of conditions that culminate in intensive care is immunocompromised due to chemotherapy, radiation, impairment of normal leukocyte function. So febrile neutropenia, an opportunistic infection, is a very major setting. Acute respiratory failure due to various types of ARDS, primary or secondary, circulatory shock, cardiac failure, or complications of the tumor itself, or complications of drug therapy, <coughs> metabolic em emergencies as the one we saw, and, uh, and then tumor lysis syndrome, and thromboembolic disease, which is increasingly uh, becoming visible, and we, are, mm -hmm. we now know that we are seen to be underestimating the burden of thromboembolism as evidenced by autopsies, which show us three times more uh, at autopsy than we are able to diagnose anti-mortem. 